Our final speaker has served in various assignments to include Commander, 2nd Armored Brigade Combat Team, 1st Infantry Division, Commander, 3rd Cavalry Regiment, and Deputy Commanding General, 3rd Infantry Division. He now serves as the Commanding General of the 1st Cavalry Division. It's a pleasure to introduce Major General John Richardson. Uh, all right, mic check. Good. All right, so I have three rules on briefings. Rule number one uh, is, you know, you're supposed to be quick, brilliant, and away, right? Well, I've never been accused of being brilliant, so I'm already going to violate that one. Second one, don't have too many slides and have lots of pictures and not a lot of words. I violate this one. Number one rule, never follow a Brit. And I couldn't help that one. Well, well done there, Matt. It was a great brief. And uh, so, uh, Colonel Donna. Or General Donahoe, Sergeant Major, uh, appreciate you, uh, you allowing me to present here. Uh, I think it's a, a great way to end after uh, following some of the, uh, the AFC briefs today uh, that kind of talk the, the bigger picture of, of why we're changing. And then th and this, this drills down into the division. And, and, and really, that is how I want to start this is, you know, why are we changing? Why should we change? And I think it's to, to rebuild and organize, reorganize a division that can enable shaping the deep fight in order to set the conditions for the BCTs uh, in maneuver. And then allow the division commander also to weight the main effort. And we talked mass with, with uh, General McKean. We're, this will allow us to mass combat power uh, in the deep fight in order to, again, set the conditions uh, for those maneuver brigades. And then there's a, one thing we didn't talk about is what's the purpose of the maneuver brigades now? Because there's a lot of consternation out there with some of the brigade commanders. What does this mean to me? What, why are you taking my, my, my assets? Now I can't fight my fight. And I, and the, I think today what we want to do is have a discussion, especially for those that are out on the outstations, on changing the mindset of how we are going to fight large-scale combat operations. And, uh, you know, as humans, we are, we are slave to our experiences, and we have, uh, we have a generation that has spent uh, their entire career in BCTs fighting irregular warfare, coin, counterinsurgency, counterterrorism. Uh, and, and so to change a mindset and change a culture, uh, it takes a very deliberate effort, and we're seeing that here. And, and, but the way you do it is first it's have these discussions. And so I really want to thank you for putting this on, Pat, and, uh, and, and we need to do more of this. We need to have more academic, professional discussions about how we're going to fight uh, large-scale combat operations. Okay, the way I'm going to frame it is uh, four parts. I'm going to start off with the gaps. Uh, in, you all know about the LISCO gaps, specifically the people in this room, uh, and I won't spend a lot of time on it, but I think you know, it's, it's the idea of starting with the red pen. You, know, you have to understand what the issue is before you go to fix it. So we'll, we'll just quickly review the gaps, specifically the division's role in closing the gaps that, that apply to a division, specifically the pen division. Then we'll move into uh, the role of the division in MDO. Really uh, set a foundation so that we can all agree, pulling some doctrine, and saying, okay, this is what a division is supposed to do in MDO. And then we'll transition to really the first half of the brief, which will be uh, a discussion based off of a, a series of three, how we fight LPDs that we did in the 1st Cavalry Division, and some of the lessons that came out of that. And, and what I'll tell you is, this is not a briefing on me telling you the answer. Really, we, we generated more things to talk about and, and that's why I appreciate uh, coming here today, because I want to put this out to the whole army. What I'm going to do is really open up a dialogue to start talking about how we, we are going to fight, and specifically these penetration divisions, what exactly the army means by a penetration division. You know, what is it? Why do we need it? Why are we building it? How we, uh, when we're building it and how we're building it. And then uh, I'll lay that out, and then transition into the RNS pilot, which... Many of you here as the DivCav pilot, which I even have up there as the DivCav pilot. Uh, we call it the RNS pilot in the, in the division because it, it 
restructures the RNS for the BCTs as well. So it's not just the division cavalry pilot. We're also piloting the armored cavalry troops that we will build for the BCTs. Okay. So just briefly on the, on the, on the gaps. I think everyone in here is very familiar with this. Uh, what I like about it, it does break down into the, the different phases of the operational uh, penetration, where we go from competition down to needing to penetrate, then disintegrate the, uh, the integrated fires and IADs of the enemy in order to open up that window of opportunity to allow for uh, close combat maneuver uh, by tactical ground forces which then gets into your exploitation. And so I, I circled the, the two areas where we have the division, and then you also see gap nine, uh, the div cab, which we'll deep dive into. All right, two papers that I would recommend if you're interested in trying to understand uh, uh, the penetration division. Uh, the first, obviously we've got the doctrine out there, and three O's coming out, uh, that will help significantly. Uh, you've, got the, you've got the FM, on uh, armies, corps, divisions. It's got a lot in there that you can take away. But then these two uh, white papers I would recommend. The first one uh, put out by the TRADOC proponent office for echelons above brigade. Uh, it lays out, quote, how we fight uh, in, in, in more of a um, conversational uh, way. So it's not as doctrine. It doesn't feel like you're reading doctrine, uh, which is good. Uh, now it, it kind of paints a, hey, this is, this is gonna work you know, swimmingly. And we'll you know, we just apply this, this, uh, this approach. The next one, which I really like, is uh, and the, the first one came out in November of 21. The next one was written by uh, Lieutenant Colonel Nate Jennings. Uh, he is a uh, history professor at, uh, at, C at CGSC. And he, he wrote it in January of, of, uh, of 22, and it's called Considering the Penetration Division. And he challenges uh, some assumptions. Uh, he also uh, uses a lot of historical examples, and I'll hit a couple of historical examples up here uh, as I go through this, uh, to start to pick up some trends when, uh, w when you start to talk about a penetration. Uh, and, you know, one thing that, uh, that for the audience out there in TV land, I think I want to clarify, because I did this with the division, and, and I was surprised how many people were, um, were, were confusing some terms. You know, there's the penetrate and MDO, which has to do with long range fires, has to do with targeting deep, CJ flick deep, core deep, to, to, to penetrate and then disintegrate uh, integrated fires and integrated IADs. That's different, that's a different role than the penetration division. Uh, and that's why I think we have to start having these discussions because I was very surprised at how many people in the division, majors coming out of CGSC that were thinking we were part of the penetration part of the, of the, uh, of the MDO. We're actually an element of the exploitation, which really we need to have that dialogue. Have we named this correctly? Should it be called a penetration division? Uh, or is it really an exploitation division? Or is it something else? Is it, uh, is it just a division that is given a, a, a mission? So uh, but I bring that up because words matter. Because we've been now, because we'll cover the, what a penetration is here and, and deep dive it and, and make sure that we're not backing ourselves into a form of maneuver uh, just because we call a division a name. And so I think that's important. All right. Uh, the division in multi-domain uh, operations. Really what I want to focus on, uh, you know, we just talked about what, what, what's going to happen in a, at the penetrate phase, and that's the theater forces, uh, army long range precision fires, uh, defeating the enemy's operational fires. And then uh, the disintegrate, you have core fires, still reinforced by the J-Flick, uh, ultimately disintegrating uh, the, the enemy's fires, IADs and fires. And why do we do that? We have to have that window of opportunity, right? If, if we roll in, with our, our maneuvers, with the divisions and the brigades, and the, the fires, the enemy's fires is still integrated. They can mass on us. And, and those of you that have participated in a warfighter, you know what happens when the enemy can still mass its fires, its integrated fires on the BCT once it comes into range. So one of the conditions that has to be set by the core 
and by the JFLIC is the disintegration of, uh, of those IADs before you commit specifically the penetration division for the decisive operation. And so ultimately what you're looking at, when the, the divisions with the A, uh, you know, the, they call them, or here they call them the forward presence. It's really what I would say are the uh, standard divisions, uh, which right now are defined as the divisions with the two brigades that, uh, that have not transformed into penetration division for, uh, formations. And then what they call the expeditionary uh, divisions are really the penetration divisions. So we're talking about B here. And, and, the, and ultimately, an effective, to effectively exploit in the close and deep maneuver area, the joint force needs a division equipped and trained to penetrate an adversary's deliberate defense and rapidly negotiate natural and man-made op uh, obstacles in order to exploit the tactical and operational successes. So that's our framework here of, of you know, baselining what is the division's purpose. And you can see there in the upper left-hand corner uh, a couple key points here. Uh, first, we've heard this throughout the, the last two days, and that is the division is the foundational maneuver echelon, and it fights in both the close and the deep maneuver areas. And then it talks about uh, forward presence divisions, or what I'm calling the standard divisions in this brief, conduct independent operational maneuver to enable joint force to target AD, A2AD systems. That's something that I think we need to talk about. And what does that actually mean? You know, the American way of war has always been, we fire to maneuver. This doctrine is talking about maneuvering so that we can fire, so that, that the enemy fires, lights themselves up so that we can fire and destroy, penetrate, disintegrate, so then we can maneuver again. And that is a different way of, of American way of war uh, and, and a different way to approach uh, fire and maneuver that we haven't going back to uh, airland battle, going back to World War II. Uh, we've always been an army that fires to maneuver. And now we're talking maneuver so we can fire, so we can maneuver. All right, a little vignette on penetration. So this put us into, in our LPD series, into a discussion about the penetration. Uh, and and uh, Colonel Jennings' uh, white paper, he, he talks specifically about this being a high risk, high reward operation, a penetration. It's a form of maneuver, and it's high risk, high reward. So we'll use, uh, the, here's the definition out of 390-1. I'll give everyone a chance to read it. And it talks about a commander employs a penetration when there's A, no assailable flank, two, the enemy has overextended themselves, and there's a weak spot that you can penetrate, and then three, uh, time pressures don't permit uh, you to do an envelopment. And so what I'd like everyone to think about, and we can talk about it during the question period, is why would we do a penetration? Uh, and and why, would we, why would we consider a penetration uh, as a form of a maneuver? So uh, Austerlitz, probably uh, uh, Napoleon's greatest victory. Uh, a couple things that we can take away from this battle as we think about the, the, next, uh, uh, the next battlefield in an MDO large-scale combat environment, and that is the use of deception. So here, Napoleon, if you look in the bottom left-hand corner down to the southwest, you'll, you'll see he hides a core, and he shows weakness on his, uh, on, his, uh, on his southern flank. And the Russians and the Austrians move thinking, oh, he's got a weak flank, we're going to envelop him uh, from, from the south. Taking great risk. For a penetration, uh, often you have to accept a lot of tactical and operational risk, which Napoleon did here. He then goes on, he brings up the next morning, the sun comes up and uh, there's a core there. And, and the Russians and the Austrians had moved the bulk of their force from the center of their formation down to try to take advantage of a weak flank. Napoleon knew this, he waited to the, to the really an exquisite timing uh, to the point where he almost lost down in the south 
and then he penetrates in the center. And what a penetration allows you to do is then defeat the enemy. You split them and you can de defeat them piecemeal, which is, of course, what he did. Um, pushing the elements onto the frozen lake there in the south, which then cracked and thousands of Russian and Austrian soldiers drowned. And then he, uh, then he was able to then turn all his forces onto the north and defeat them in the north. Probably more applicable to our discussion is the Blitzkrieg in 1940. Uh, and and I'm, we'll just stay on it a little bit and then we're going to talk about some of the considerations of, for penetration and uh, the penetration division in MDO large-scale combat operations. And that is Heinz Guderian's penetration of the French at Sedan and then his drive to the sea. And uh, there's a couple things that uh, we'll talk about on the next slide that, that, that I think are applicable to uh, our thought process on how we're going to fight MDO uh, in the future. And, and things that are, are considerations for penetration uh, that, that I don't think we have completely teased out yet uh, in, our, in our formation and in our doctrine. So he does have, uh, he has a contested uh, wet gap crossing on the Meuse. He comes very close to not crossing and culminating at the Meuse. Been a disaster. Uh, it, he, didn't, does, he does penetrate, he does get across. Uh, creates, uh, you know, the loss of cohesion in the, in the Allies because uh, he gets back into their rear. Uh, he, German high command wants him to stop. He doesn't. He keeps going because they're concerned he'll culminate. Uh, and he makes it all the way to the, to the coast. And, and we all know with, within two weeks, France falls. Uh, we've got Dunkirk. Uh, and, and it's a huge success. And now Blitzkrieg is on the map. And, uh, and, and would then come into American doctrine from there as we started to build armored divisions. But we're going to talk about some of the things that, uh, that are specific to this and why he was able to be successful that we need to take into consideration before we attempt some kind of uh, penetration with a penetration division. Lots of words. I'll talk you through them because I think these are the important points that came out of our LPD series on how we fight. All right, the first one, the division penetration occurs within a larger N MDO con concept that relies on core shaping efforts, joint disintegration, and dislocation. Okay, I've already, I think I've hit that one hard enough. We can't penetrate unless the, the core uh, and the JFLIC have, have filled their kill contract, or at least enough that the, the risk that they pass down to us is manageable by the division in the division deep fight. All right, we've talked about this. Penetration represents a high risk, high demand, a high risk, high reward option. And historically, we have not used penetrations. The U.S. Army typically goes with an envelopment, a flank attack, or a turning movement. And those are, are, are less risky because if, if you do culminate on that, you're typically, you're, you're not as vulnerable. You are, you're on an enemy flank, and you can go into a HCD, and then you can reestablish you can replan, you can, and, and, then, and then go back on the offense on your terms. On a penetration, if you penetrate, and then you culminate, and you allow the enemy to, because the, the idea of the penetration is you, you break their, the, you, you rupture their defense, and they've lost cohesion in their defense. And then you take advantage, you've got the initiative, and you just drive it until, they, until you, uh, you win decisively at that point. If you culminate after the penetration, uh, you're vulnerable to flank attacks, uh, them closing the gap, and now you're isolated from the rest of the force. All right, uh, critical to the success of penetration is the execution of an exploitation. That's really what I just talked about, which will follow on behind the successful attack and is designed to disorganize the enemy in depth and win decisively. The flip side of the same coin is a penetration force cannot culminate before reaching its objective, or it will have a catastrophic uh, defeat. I think five, six, and seven, though, are, the, are the, probably the key points that came out of our LPD series. Uh, and I think General, uh, Colonel uh, Jennings in his paper brings these out pretty well as well. And we can use uh, the Battle of France, 1940, to talk about these. Uh, and these are the three, I'd say, the three things that uh, if you look historically at penetrations and you look, and you look at what 
the doctrine that what they're talking about, the penetration division doing uh, in MDO, these are three considerations that I think we, we, as a profession, in forums like this, we have got to talk about and, and decide whether or not we have the right formation uh, that we'll talk about here in a minute with the penetration division. Organic mobility must maintain the momentum to, in order to maintain the initiative. That's the ability to do wet gap crossings or any uh, man-made or uh, natural obstacle. You can't, you can't stop. You have to have the internal organic mobility assets to allow you to continue to press the attack uh, or you could culminate. Similar to Guderian at, at the Muse uh, at, at Sedan, that he had to continue going. If, if he failed to cross that river and keep going, he culminates at the Maginot Line. Tactical sustainment. I'll tell you the three words that General McKean said that will ring in my, my ears for a while, and it goes to our LPD series because it's something we never resolved. Sustainment, sustainment, sustainment. The reason Guderian was able to get to the coast was because he carried all of his sustainment with him, all of his fuel and all of his ammo with him. There was no log packs. There was no going back. A penetration division can't do that. The locks get too long. In the tabletop exercise we did uh, to come up with some of these considerations, we, we used the Sawaki Gap. And, uh, and, and uh, after crossing the river, it's a 75, 80 kilometer lock to the point of penetration, not beyond, not even beyond the point of penetration. The way we do logistics right now, the way we do sustainment doesn't support that, that kind of uh, form of maneuver. It will, will run out of gas uh, under the current doctrine. So we have really got to look at how we plan to, to sustain a division that you're going to launch uh, through a uh, you know through a pen point of penetration and into the enemy's rear, uh, and I, I I couldn't agree more with General McKean. I mean, we hand wave this in in every kind of exercise that we do. War fighters. I mean, and if and he said exactly, you know, I've heard it a hundred times. Well, we got to get to the maneuver training objectives, you know, and so we artificially. Uh, sustain ourselves in those, and we learn false lessons. And I think if, if we were to go into this without a uh, wide-eyed, that, uh, that sustainment could potentially be the, the cause of culmination for our penetration division. And the last one is the joint and combined arms asymmetric, uh, asymmetries, so those offsets. And that, and, you know, we put historically, it's been an essential in order to, to require, uh, to maintain that that required uh, rate of march at depth. So a lot of people, you go back to 1940 and Kadarian, a lot of people think, oh, it's because it was an armored division, right? That everybody was either uh, on a tank, armored personnel carrier, or in a truck. You know, that everybody was uh, in a combustible engine. Well, that was a factor, but really what, what, it was the asymmetric advantages that the Germans had in that fight that really allowed the penetration and the decisive victory. One, and, and Colonel Antal hit it yesterday, radios in everybody's vehicle. It's the first time everybody could communicate, and I think Matt hit it. You know, it took the, all of the rest of us a little bit longer to figure that out. The Germans had a radio in everybody's vehicle, so they could all talk. The commanders could cross-talk and, and maintain uh, the pressure on the Allies. And then the second is the dive bomber, the Stuka dive bomber. So close air support, like never seen before. Uh, those, are, those are the two asymmetric offsets in that fight. Ours are these multi-domain capabilities that we're trying to develop. And so these offsets, and they have to overmatch, because that's what, that's what the radio and the Stuka dive bomber did for the Germans. It allowed them to overmatch the, the French forces. And so, uh, as we think about modernization, we have to think about these, what are the asymmetric offsets that we're going to, to employ in conjunction with a penetration division to give us that asymmetric advantage. 
I do agree, soldiers are in leadership, the American soldier and, and uh, our mission command philosophy carries us a long way, but uh, I think we need to, to double down on some of our modernization to, to truly have an asymmetric advantage over uh, some of our adversaries. All right, then the last two, are you, you can kind of join those two together. Accurate cog analysis, campaign design, not for the division, uh, but really, it, really what this is, that you can't penetrate for penetration's sake. Right? You have to have an objective that you're going for, and it's got to be decisive. Because um, if you're just penetrating to get into the rear without, uh, without going for a decisive uh, objective, typically an operational level objective, uh, you allow the enemy to regroup, uh, reestablish cohesion, and then potentially uh, you, uh, you culminate and you don't finish the, the penetration, or you don't, you don't achieve the exploitation that you could have out of the penetration. All right, so how are we gonna get there? So this is Waypoint 2028 Penetration Division. And so, uh, you know, I'll, I'll talk through uh, really the growth and the reorganization of the division. Okay, in the yellow, I'll bring them up and I'll kind of talk you through what we're doing. All right, so the first thing I brought up, the headquarters of the Devardi. All right, uh, if I was king for the day, I would move the guns today out of the artillery, out of the BCTs, and I'd move them into the Devardi. Um, because that's where I believe they belong so that the division can use them to mass fires and or wait a main effort because BCTs aren't gonna fight them by themselves, they're gonna fight uh, as part of a division plan. I haven't done that because the Devardi staff as structured right now can't handle taking care of, of three battalions. It, you know, it's not built to do that. Uh, it was, uh, you know, he's got a skeleton uh, staff and he's really, uh, he, my, my Devardi commander is, uh, he's really the fist cord. Uh, and so uh, until the army restructures that battalion and provides him the, the depth of staff that he needs to take care of three battalions, uh, we're gonna leave the, the, the cannons in the, in the BCTs. The next thing you have to build is this, his, his BSB. Well, he doesn't really have one. It's more like a company. Uh, he has to have the, the sustainment support inside the, his brigade before he can bring uh, three battalions of, of artillery into the, uh, into the battalion. And then uh, Joan Camper talked about the Urca, bringing an Urca battalion in. Uh, and, and, and then at that point, that's the growth in the Devardi between now and 2028. Next, the Engineer Brigade and uh, the Protection Brigade. This goes to the organic mobility. You'll see uh, five companies of uh, MRBCs. I, if I'm not mistaken, that's half of all the active duty MRBCs in the Army right now would come to the division uh, and, and, and be in the engineer brigade. Uh, and then seven uh, uh, combat engineer companies as well. So pretty significant mobility capability to be built in. And, and you see on each of, uh, each of the uh, icons, if you see the diamond, you'll see a number in it, and that's the number associated with the gap on the first slide uh, that, that the Army is trying to fill. The protection brigade. Uh, we're really talking about the, the rear area. And uh, you know, it, I don't think they fleshed out who would command it. Could be an engineer, I think it could be an MP, potentially a chemical officer. But you're really talking about a, a command and control element to provide uh, C2 and security in the rear area. You'll see the M Shorad. Uh, it will ultimately fall in under that brigade. Uh, and it's one of the earlier builds in the, in the pinned, pinned uh, penetration division. All right, the next one, RCVs. And that really rounds out the growth. That's the growth inside of, uh, inside the division. Next is some reorganization. First, the DSB, the Division Support Brigade. As you know right now, they're, they're, I mean, Sustainment Brigade. Right now it's a Sustainment Brigade. It is decoupled from the DSSB, 
which used to be a CSSB, which then had, didn't have numbered companies, it had, um, I mean, lettered companies, it had numbers companies, which meant Forcecom could you know, pluck them out you know, as separate entities uh, and, and use them uh, to support COCOM uh, requirements. So uh, the sustainment community, they are, they are probably in the lead in trying to reorganize. Uh, and they have already, so the CSSB, which is there is the support battalion, it is already a DSSB. And those three companies are now lettered companies, Alpha, Bravo, and Charlie. The next is the DSB. Uh, it, it now becomes a division sustainment brigade with the DSSB reporting to it. So that's one major reorganization. The next is the three uh, cannon battalions coming to the Devardi. And so now your Devardi is, is complete. There'll be some minor modifications to the aviation brigade. Uh, I won't go too, uh, into too much detail. Uh, you know, the, it really has to do with pu pulling some of the lift assets out of the heavy uh, divisions and moving them over to some of the light divisions for for lift capability, um, but not too significant of a, a reorganization. The big one that we're going to deep dive here today will be the, the reorganization of, the, of the, uh, the cavalry squadron across the, the brigades and the division. And you'll see there, uh, we will establish uh, a, a, a division cavalry squadron, uh, and then each of the brigades will get an armored cavalry troop as their RNS. All right, and so now I'm going to show you a next slide that kind of shows you how we're doing this over time, and uh, specifically uh, the Div Cav, and and what the Army has has asked us to do, and I think it is prudent, and we should consider it in, in some of the other uh, um, areas is. Uh, the, uh, the pilot is two years ahead of the TAA change. So, you know, go to the next slide. So here we are, if you, if you see div cap pilot circled, you've got uh, uh, that pilot taking place in 22-23, uh, but if you look down into the blue area, you'll, you'll see the actual TAA, uh, it, it doesn't take place, so the changeover doesn't happen until 24. So what the pilot does for us and this is why I think it is such a, a, a significantly uh, impactful decision by the chief to do this, is during my tenure as a CG, we will build, reorganize, train, certify this DivCav so that when I pass the colors to my successor, in, right before FY24, he has got a certified turnkey. I mean, it's ready. It's ready on day one instead of spending the next two years of his command building a, a div cap. Uh, and, and so I think it's, uh, this is it's significant. It also allows us to then provide feedback to TRADOC uh, along Dotland PF. I'll be honest, when, I, when, when uh, Pat and General Rainey asked me to do this, I thought it was going to be really easy. I was like, oh yeah, I'll just pull the cap squadron up and it'll be the div cap. It is hard and it is going to take full two years to do. It is, it is much more challenging than I thought. And what I hope to do is then collect those lessons and pass them to First Armor Division, who will be doing the same thing in 24 and not have to learn some of the hard lessons. You also see we are building the MSHOR Red down in, in, the, in the bottom. I color coded this to kind of give a, a, some, some food for thought. You see today and you see 2028. You know, I am, I'm concerned that we are, we are we should do more of these pilots, and we should be moving this left as fast as we can. You know, um, like we talk about being the penetration division at Fort Hood and First Cap. I mean, it sounds cool, but I'm yellow. My successor is blue. His successor is red. His successor will actually have a penetration division. That's a long time to build what I just showed you in the last slide. And we know what's happening in the world. Uh, even today. And so uh, I think every chance we can do something like this DivCav pilot uh, where we can move things left so that when we hit the, the, these decision points, 
they're already established. Now we just put them into play. And then I'm going to make this, this is just a plug. Uh, this, is a, this is something I've talked to General White about, uh, General Garrett, and General Rainey. Uh, and, and that is, uh, we have to, specifically with the, the Penn divisions, if you want these divisions to fight as divisions, they have to train as divisions. And right now, we're still piecemealing uh, this division. Now, are we technically a Penn div division? No, and so there's gonna be, a, there's gonna be a, uh, a transition period, but my position is, my mark on the wall is FY24, the first calf has to be taken off the quote patch chart, All right? Uh, I'll give you the example of today. If you called first calf to go as a Penn division somewhere. Right now, the cab, the Combat Aviation Brigade from the division is in Europe working for uh, First ID. Uh, my sustainment brigade, my, my DSSB is broken into three companies. Two of them are on rotation to Europe. The sustainment brigade and the other company had just got put on a PTDO. Uh, and my Devardi is still really in the in brigades. So we aren't ready to train or fight as a division. I've got a warfighter coming up. And, and what does a division fight with? It fights with its artillery, its cab, and its sustainment brigade. That's, that's, how we, that's, that's what we bring to the fight. And, and right now, uh, to fill COCOM requirements, the Army's only penetration division is spread across CENTCOM and UCOM uh, and not training as a division. Understand that's where we are right now, but I say my successor in 24 has to have all those elements. BCTs, you want to send them to, you know, we're aligned to Europe, you want to send them on rotation, that's okay. But you got to keep those elements together. They have to fight together. They have to train together. If you want to move all of us to, over to Europe to do something for a year, nine months, okay, but we got to go as a team. Uh, or we will continue uh, uh, to be in this mindset that we, we fight as BCTs and, and not build a division. All right. So we'll deep dive into the, in, into the penetration, or into the uh, RNS pilot. All right, this is what it looks like uh, on paper. You're on your left, you have what, what we have today uh, across all of our armored brigade combat teams, where we have brigades that have a cavalry squadron. And then uh, on your right, you can see how we split it out. Uh, you know, in, in the 1st Cav, 1-7 Cav will come out of 1st Brigade and, and we will build uh, that, that Div Cav squadron that you see in the upper right. Uh, we'll deep, I'll break this down because you'll see these are significant, uh, these are significant cavalry troops uh, inside, the, that, inside that squadron. And then I'll also, we'll talk in detail about that, uh, that icon with the, with the triangle here in a bit. Down below it, are the armored brigade combat teams, um, armored cavalry troops, ACTs. Again, a significant, um, powerful combat force with, with uh, two platoons of uh, six by 36 scouts with uh, two tank platoons. The troops, so if the troops that are in the div cav look exactly like the troops that are there in the ACT minus uh, the uh, chemical recon off to the right. Those are only in the, in the BCTs and not in the division's uh, cavalry squadron. All right, lots of words again. Uh, ultimately, it's got to do cross-domain reconnaissance and security and be able to do economy of force. And it really, this ends the debate, I think, uh, on stealth versus fighting for information. Uh, I, these formations are built to fight for information, to conduct uh, reconnaissance, conduct security, to include screen and a guard, and then uh, execute economy of force missions. All the while setting the conditions, answering PIR for me so that I can fight a deep fight. Uh, I would also argue they will most likely uh, provide security for the Corps' uh, ar artillery for their rockets, moving them up into, uh, forward in the battle space so that they can range uh, 
the guns that currently out, outrange us uh, when it comes to some of our adversaries in the A2A, AD bubble. All right. More detail uh, showing the breakdown. I'll let everyone digest that. So uh, while you're looking at that, uh, well, let's talk the, the cross the main troop because that's the new significant addition to this, this, this squadron. Uh, it's the landing place. If you read a lot of the MDO doctrine, that a lot of the units says we build them, we need a landing place. So that is the landing place for uh, new technologies. Uh, and so the division is working very closely with uh, Futures Command. In fact, uh, the Div Cav 17 Cav will will be a, a a key player in PC uh, Project Convergence 22. Uh, it's going to go out there and, and execute. Uh, uh, missions A with what they have today, and then uh, uh, Futures Command and General Kaufman are going to give them some new equipment, uh, new vehicles, some swarm UAVs, lots of lots of uh, of uh, new technologies then to go out. So fight the 11th ACR as as they are, and then fight the 11th ACR with some of the new technologies out there, so that so that uh, uh, the Joint Force can start to do some analysis on on uh, what works, what doesn't. I got two questions down at the bottom. And, and whenever I brief uh, some of the older cavalry men, I'm, I'm gonna preempt the, the General Swan's uh, question that usually comes from, from, the, from the cavalry men that fought under the, the H series, the J series, is where are the helicopters? Uh, you, for those of you familiar with the Div Cav uh, prior to 2004, organic air cav uh, that, that provided operational reach for the, the division commander. Uh, not, not baked in uh, into the, the current structure. I will tell you though that uh, we have plans to use 717 cav out of our cab to have a, a, not organic, but a habitual relationship with the div cav. At least one troop, if not two. Uh, and so though not, not depicted here. Uh, we envision in the division uh, integrating uh, the air cab, two air cab troops uh, with the div cab to provide that, the, that dip, additional reconnaissance depth uh, and, and operational reach uh, for, for the squadron. And then as far as our artillery, uh, we, we anticipate at least uh, one, one battery uh, being DS to it. Uh, at least during certain parts of, of the mission. The cavalry troops. So this would be the, uh, the ACTs, but it's also the same configuration for the, the div cav minus the, the, the NBC recon. All right, so how are we getting there? Uh, they're in modernization right now. You see where it says today. We're in modernization. Uh, then they'll hit their training window uh, at the end of the summer. Uh, they'll participate in Project Convergence 22, go back into their training window. They'll participate in Warfighter 23-4, uh, which is, is the division's warfighter, uh, multinational with uh, third UK. Uh, and so we will employ them in the warfighter, take lessons learned from that. And then they will turn around and uh, they will go to the National Training Center uh, with 1st Brigade uh, and the Division TAC, elements of the CAB and elements of the Divardi. And we will fight a, a Div CAV fight as a division. They will move off to the flank and then 1st Brigade will do a normal rotation uh, with an ACT, with an armored cavalry troop. Again, and, and then uh, we'll, we'll glean lessons from both the, the Warfighter and the NTC. And uh, God willing, we will Bless them as FOC, uh, and in about six months or three or four months after that, the TAA goes into effect, and, and the First Cavalry Division has a uh, has a Division Cavalry Squadron. All right. Discussion questions. I'll just put this up. This is a reference. If anyone has any questions, sir, I have a question. I was in Div Cav fight when it was turned into 
like a regular reconnaissance squadron 37 calf so i remember this very well i didn't get to fight it but i was a part of it so the survivability problem sir so in the war fighters i've conducted as div cav at fourth id we were wiped out by rotary wing fixed wing and the ifc massing on us in the early phase they were looking for us and they destroyed us like 10 times over how have you guys in your experience in your experiment sir addressed the survivability problem so it goes to that kill contract so the acting core commander for that warfighter, are you talking about the last 4ID warfighter? Yes, sir. The acting core commander of 3 Corps at that time was me. And because uh, <laughs> General White was, in, uh, was still in Iraq. Uh, and I will tell you, I did not understand MDO. I didn't understand, um, I didn't understand penetrate, disintegrate. Uh, and as a result, 4ID was annihilated. I did not set the conditions as a corps commander. Um, I didn't. I didn't. Um, I didn't penetrate his A2AD. A2 uh, I didn't uh, disintegrate his his IADs or his uh, integrated fires command. And as a result, they masked everything on 4ID, and that division ceased to exist in about 24 to 48 hours. Uh, so the way you protect them is. Everyone has to win their echelon fight. Uh, and decisions have to be made. If we haven't won that fight, you don't, you, do, you, do you change the timeline? Now, of course, in a warfighter, we haven't got time. Today's the day. Uh, but in real, in real world, that, that is a commander-to-commander -commander conversation between, uh, between the, the JFLIC commander, the core commander, and the division commanders on whether or not that kill contract between echelons was achieved. And if it wasn't, then we have to relook at, at the plan. Uh, and, and I'll tell you, I, I know I learned a lot of lessons. And this really goes to, again, what General McKean talked about. I think, I think Colonel Antal touched on we got to get these steps and reps. Because then I went right back into another warfighter with one ID, this time as a deputy. Uh, and, and we did better as a staff, as a core staff, because we learned from the, uh, what we did wrong with 4ID. And we did much better with one ID. And then it was, uh, then three, four months later, we did our actual warfighter. War those were, we were response cells in both those. And then our warfighter uh, was with one AD. And, uh, and I'll tell you, we performed much better. I mean, I think we, I think we got it, right? Uh, and uh, and we, we started understanding what it meant to penetrate, what it meant to, and how to, to do assessments. And that was the other piece is, you know, learning how to assess your battle damage so that you can have that conversation with the divisions uh, and, and also talk about the risks so that the division commanders know, hey, we didn't kill what we said we were going to kill. It's now your risk because we're moving on. The, the deep fight is moving. Uh, and, and, and so because we're part of a larger plan, part of a larger JFLIC plan. And so I think the best way to protect them uh, is, is that we have to, we have to integrate our, and have um, uh, a, a clear understanding of whose fight is what and who's killed what before we, we put uh, our forces into, into peril unnecessarily. Thank you, sir. Any, any hey, questions from the room? Hey, yes, sir. Hey, Johnny. Go out here. Um, this, is, this is great. Thank you for presenting this. Um, facilities. So, so this is this is a pretty, you know, pretty pretty good reorganization here for the division. You're you're organized a certain way now. You're gonna you're gonna add some stuff, drop some stuff out of the cavalry squadrons in the in the brigade combat teams there. But but they're all living in motor pool space and bays and all that stuff back with their BCTs. And the F and dot mil PFP is always the last thing we think about. So how's that going at Fort Hood? You know, thinking thinking about it from like a senior commander perspective and for all the resources required to to give this organization the identity that it needs to fight the way it's going to fight. Because if its pieces are still disaggregated in, in your garrison, they're sort of never going to form that cohesive identity. How's that going? So that's a great question. And that's why I would say the facilities is probably the part that I completely underestimated. Uh, and uh, my hat is off to the 1st Cavalry Division, Division staff. 
They have an OPT that, that, that meets weekly on this topic, uh, and, they, and they work their way through each one of these. Uh, and, and so the division engineer is in there, uh, and we talk the facilities. And, and the motor pool moves and, uh, you know, shifting. Uh, 13th ESC has helped us out, uh, given us some motor pool space as kind of the swing area, because uh, unlike a warfighter where you can magic move people, it is, it is hard. And, and then the barracks, uh, you know, reorganizing the barracks, because uh, now you don't have a squadron in your brigade. You have a troop, and now you have a separate squadron that does not work for the brigade. It works for the division. And so we've identified some barracks, and so the whole squadron will live in the same barracks, uh, and, and then will be in its own motor pool. But it is a, a six-month process to move the people and the equipment around. Again, something I completely underestimated uh, in, in when I took on the mission. Another reason why it's a good thing we're doing it, because now my successor, when he comes, and he gets told, hey, make a, make a div cab real. He doesn't have to do anything. It's already moved and it's already um, established. And it, like I said, a turnkey for him. Sorry. Hey, Johnny. Um, what do you see as the purpose for the cavalry troop and the brigade combat teams now? And does it have enough combat power to achieve that purpose? So, uh, in my mind, uh, and this is where it goes back to having to rethink what a brigade combat team is, is, is uh, it, what its purpose is, and then also what conditions, when it hits the close fight, what conditions have been set for it? And so therefore, what does it need? Does it need artillery if it's not the main effort? Does it need a cavalry squadron? I say, I, th I think no. Uh, I think that a, a BCT fighting as part of a division, maneuvering as part of a division, uh, when knowing that you've already got the diff cab that's gone through, the diff cab that's identifying P PIR, diff cab that's uh, um, identifying targets uh, in the deep area to, to be executed, the brigades Reconnaissance and security element is really a bit of a counter recon. Uh, develop the situation for that brigade commander. And I think because of the frontage that they're going to have as part of a division fight, that that troop can do that for a, a brigade commander, understanding it's part of the, the division fight. My concern is less the brigades as it is the Corps. Because now you have the Corps, the division is the first cavalry organization that's out there. And like Mr. Sando said today, every echelon needs reconnaissance and security. I'm, I'm not saying you have to have an ACR of 1990, but the core commander, having done three uh, warfighters with three corps last year, the core commander has to have some form of reconnaissance and security. I don't know what it looks like. I don't know if it has to have tanks, Does it, robots, what, something. Uh, but right now, uh, my concern would be the core commander doesn't have the eyes and ears that he needs uh, to fight his fight uh, before the div cav uh, enters the, the, uh, the disruption zone. And, and so uh, we did the last warfighter with the 3rd Cavalry Regiment uh, as an ABCT. Uh, and uh, they're out in front of the Brits and a little bit in front of the French. And uh, it didn't go well, and, uh, and, and I'll tell you, it has to do with some lost skills. Uh, you know, the, the commander of the 3rd Cavalry Regiment right now is probably one of our Army's best cavalrymen, hands down. Never been in a division, right? He grew up in a BCT. He, he was in, he's been in, in cavalry squadrons in a BCT. And then you throw him out in front of a corps. I mean, he did his best, but he doesn't have the sets and reps. He doesn't have the mindset. When it, and, and this goes back to Dalton PF, right? Leader development. We got to start growing this, and, and probably going to face this with some of these div cav commanders. Uh, you know, it's it's easy to say, oh, and it sounds sexy. Yeah, I'm the div cav commander. It's a different skill set than being in front of a BCT. 
and 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 being on a uh, on a battlefield uh, for large uh, large scale combat operations. It's just, uh, and I think we're going to see that uh, with our majors uh, and with our com with our squadron commanders. Tom, you have a very loud voice. Sir, just uh, as, we, as we kick around the idea of Division Cavalry Squadron here, a, a couple of points you ask questions like why penetration and, uh, you know, just look in it as a form of maneuver um, and why I, I, we look at this as I don't think there's going to be an offset. And this is some of the ideas we kick around in the Armor School. There's not a pure, pure adversary means there is no offset. And I think getting to General McKean's point, it's mass. Mass is our offset in this case here. It's massing effects and decisive spaces to create an opportunity to go through. So that's why I think it's the form of maneuver is penetration. Because unlike the German example you provided, their operational problem was the Maginot Line, and they mostly drove around the Maginot Line. In this case here, I think we're seeing a situational Maginot Line that is just going to be created and can go anywhere. And so we're not going to be able to bypass like that in the German. So this that right. so that point up front in terms of you know just you know, trying to add to that discussion of why a penetration. So then taking it a step further with a penetration, historically then if it's a penetration, it's really a penetration in depth, an operational penetration with your division being the lead element. Historically, our cavalry squadrons don't lead in penetrations, right? I mean, method one, method two, you look back to old doctor and they're LDing, you know, either simultaneously or they lead the, behind a brigade where a brigade is fighting as an advanced guard and then at a certain point it, it shifts around. And so, so the idea, and I'd like to get your thoughts on it is instead of like R and S, we've always we always use reconnaissance as a as a primary means. Reconnaissance, big R, little S. And I was wondering what your thoughts are on maybe it's a little R, right? And we use some technology to assist in collecting some of our information, and then we go big S. Because as we achieve a breakthrough, it's really our flanks and you know that we have to worry about. So any any thoughts on yeah. you know security as primacy versus reconnaissance? So when we did our tabletop uh, it is definitely the, a little r, big S, uh, and then uh, then a big E, economy of force. So what, when we identified the point of penetration, that weak spot uh, that we were going to penetrate, the div cav peeled off uh, to a flank guard, and then that lead BCT went for the point of penetration. Uh, and, and I agree with you on... Uh, Convergence, which is mass. I mean, that is our asymmetric. That's why we have to get this right. That's why, that's why I volunteered to send the, the, the CAF squadron out to Project Convergence so we can start understanding what that looks like as a division. Like, what, what is the, the conversion? Uh, convergence, in my mind, is multi domain mass. And, uh, and so uh, I do think that, and that's, but that's why we have to get it right. Uh, because that opens up that, that window of opportunity uh, to, to execute the penetration. Which I'd be interested in people's opinion on, you know, is this a penetration division? I mean, what, what really is this? Because uh, I, I think we have to be very careful because we don't want to back our way self into, oh, we do penetrations. That's not maybe always the right form of maneuver, right? Uh, I'll take 1st Armored Division in our last warfighter. Uh, they didn't do a penetration. Uh, they went around the flank. They enveloped uh, and, and got into the rear uh, from the you know, west uh, and then turned the battlefield to, to force the, 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 the Denovians to fight um, east-west instead of north-south like they wanted to. Um, and so maybe it isn't always going to be a penetration. You know, maybe it will be a... Uh, but you're still going to need the same elements, I think, of, of a formation. We, have, we did talk about this, and I'll throw this on the table. Maybe why did we say a penetration? Why, why do we think maybe a penetration at the operational level is what we have to do? And it may have to do, back to that definition of uh, penetration, you know, Napoleon used it because he found a point of weakness. We may have to use it because of time. The, the window of opportunity to penetrate and then exploit on, uh, on, on an MDO large-scale combat operation battlefield may be very limited. We can take down their IADs and we can take down their IFC, but it is resilient. They can bring it back up. So you, have a, you may have, 
And the other piece, so do you have to do a penetration because of speed? You have to penetrate quickly and get into their rear before they can regenerate and, and reestablish that uh, integrated fire command. Because if you get caught out in no man's land and they reestablish it, your window's closed and you didn't, you didn't get to the objective that we talked about. Uh, that's one reason I, I think you, you could... You could argue that penetration is on everybody's mind. That has to do with you have limited time. You don't have time to do an envelopment. The other piece I think you could talk about is what Colonel Antal talked about, and that is there's nowhere to hide. I mean, an envelopment, you, know, you want to envelop and then show up in their rear. They know you're there. You know, they know you're coming. You're not going to hide an envelopment. So if they, if they can see you the whole time, then they can readjust before you get there. So that's, a, that's another piece. And it takes a lot longer, which then not only can they see you, then they have time to reestablish their, their integrated fires in ADA. But I would argue that we do have a, the, the, the Maginot Line is a 2AD bubble. That's our Maginot Line, which we have to penetrate operationally with fires to allow maneuver. OK, I think I'm probably out of time. Hey, sir, one more. Hey, a couple things. One. Thanks for volunteering. I know you, it was more than you bargained for, but we couldn't do it without you. Loving it. Right? So I, this is great. Uh, agree on moving everything as far left as you can, because when you look at, hey, four division commanders to make the change, I mean, that's, that's a little rough. So I think we can do it faster, and we can only do it faster if you and your other commanders, you know, agree to do it, right? We can get caught up with uh, TOEs and, and bumper numbers later, right? So we appreciate that. Working in Project Convergence is a great idea, and, and we'll do everything we can to help help that squadron uh, be successful. Back for naming, right? So <clears throat> either names, either words matter or they don't, right? right? So I'm not sure how the Army picked that name. We here generally don't like it. Right? We try and just say it's an armored division reinforced. You and First Armor are going to be, you know, look like we want all of our armored divisions to look like. We know we can't make them all look that way, certainly right now. But as we focus in the Army of, of 2030, going through Waypoint of 28, uh, that's kind of how we describe it. You know, <clears throat> penetration, penetration division as a name doesn't matter unless people get focused on penetration as a form of maneuver or a tactical task. Uh, so we, we, look, we try to look at it more broadly. Uh, so we support that. And, you know, I, I don't know that we need to become too aggressive on the name yet. Uh, but as we look at it, it's, it's more than penetration. Right. Uh, it's what do we really want that division to do? How do we want to organize it? And the point about mass, right? So it's, it's you know, mass and combat power. And combat power in this environment is, is not shoulder to shoulder. It is effects in all domains. So I, I do think as we look at convergence, is what does that mean? It's stacking effects in all those domains to create a condition which enables your division to maneuver effectively and achieve, and achieve whatever operational objective. So, sir, thanks for doing this. Thanks, for right? Sir. We'll do everything we can to help you. Uh, and if you and if you fail, it's all on you, right? So, no, really, we we appreciate it. And I think uh, Jason Kidder and our ABCT teams working with with your staff and the commanders. Uh, what does this look like? How do we want to do it? And I've talked to General McKean last night about what learning objectives do we really want out of PC to make it successful so that your successor and that organization is ready to go. So thank you, sir. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone. All right. Thank you, sir. On behalf of Major General Donahoe and Sergeant Major Garner, thank you for your attendance today. We'll begin day three tomorrow morning here on Marshall Auditorium at 0820 hours. Thank you. Have a nice evening.